Right, that's half past, so um, should we make a start? Um, so, hi everyone. Uh, welcome to another edition of our BI and data webinar sessions uh, brought to you by Robert Walters. Today, uh, I'm pleased to say we're joined by Martin Squires, uh, Director of Advanced Analytics over at Pets at Home. Now, he'll be speaking about the leadership skills he's acquired over the years for insight and data teams. Um, now, before we pass you over to Martin, just um, a brief bit about me. If you just have the next slide, Martin. Thanks. So uh, for those of you who don't know me already, uh, my name is Chris Ingman. I'm a senior recruiting consultant over at Robert Walters, specialising in business intelligence, data and analytics. Um, now, I've, I've mentioned this before, but it's especially true now uh, as the lockdown begins to ease. We are getting busier and busier. Um, we've got a lot of uh, quite a few new roles come in. So I mean, I'm working BI developer roles, architect roles, manager roles. Uh, and I know a lot of people have been unfortunately victims of the current situation. So if you found yourself in the need for a new role uh, or just want to know what the market is like, feel free to get in touch. Um, also, um, as I mentioned, we are noticing a lot of our clients begin to recruit again, albeit remotely. So um, if you're if you're in that situation looking to start things up again, feel free to get in touch again. Happy to help out. Uh, just on the next slide, Martin, it just has a brief overview of um, so these are the typical roles we, we tend to recruit for. So uh, my details are at the bottom, my phone number, uh, email and LinkedIn. So as I mentioned, feel free to get in touch. We'll be more than happy to help. Uh, and if you just have the next slide. So um, back by popular demand, we've got our Power BI lunch and learn sessions um that we starting up again on wednesday the 10th of june um now our last um our last season was really well received i know by a lot of you uh, for those of you who don't know this this um this basically weekly one hour sessions um in which we uh, have various speakers discussing hints tips and <coughs> business case scenarios within power bi um as, as i mentioned we have a, we had a lot of people join a lot of people felt, felt they're really good so starting up again uh, as you can see this one's the world tour so we've got um, speakers from the us Australia, India, Canada, and um, I'll be going on for a few weeks, so look out for that. Um, I've actually not included the slide, apologies, but we've, next um, our next webinar session will be with Abed Ajra. He's the head of data analytics over at Moneypenny. Um, he'll be discussing how to embed data science into an organisation. So again, look out for that. I will put a slide up on the end that also has our meetup page, but to be honest, the best way to follow and stay up to date with the webinar session is just to join the page um, you get all the information there um, and that's it from me. So um, obviously throughout the session um, we'll be taking questions. Um, so I'll be manning the, the chat box. So put any questions you have there and um, I'll pass them. I'll give them over to Martin at the end. We'll be doing a 15 minute Q&A at the end, give or take. Um, also, as always, I just ask if you can keep your mic and video off just to make sure it runs a bit smoother. Um, and that's it from me. So over to you, Martin. Thank you very much. Um, hopefully everybody can hear me. So, uh, yeah, this is who, who I am. Um, I, as, uh, as mentioned, I'm currently Director of Advanced Analytics Pets at Home. Uh, I'm also a visiting professor at University College London in Geospatial Analysis and Computing, or Posh Maps. Um, prior to Pets at Home, I've had roles in Data and Insight and Analytics for HomeServe, Walgreens Boots Alliance, M&S Money, Bradford and Bingley, and going back far enough, I was a customer and market understanding team leader at National and Provincial. Uh, so I've basically been number crunching for marketing and uh, trading teams for about 30 years. Um, th this hour um, or three quarters of an hour comes out of um, a, it's a match of the day version rather than the full game of a one day training course that I've run a few times in um, leadership in insight and analytics teams and the reason it was created is I, I started out as an analyst in the late 80s early 90s and I found that technical skills were easy to learn and there's always been courses there for technical skills 
the change from analyst to senior analyst I found was actually really quite easy because you basically just got bigger and better projects to do and got access to more key stakeholders. So it was great. Um, no real change to the job. And then I got promoted and then it all got a bit complicated and didn't really sort of get an awful lot of support. And a lot of the process I found quite weird. So I, I thought that was a far bigger jump and there isn't an awful lot of training out there. So um, these are just a few thoughts on why things go a little bit wrong with how people set up leadership in insight teams, what I think it's really about, and what I think the differences are to leadership in general managerial roles. Um, as I say, it's, uh, for anybody who's watching me on screen, that, that version there is the normal haircut. This is what happens when you know you need a haircut two days before lockdown and don't quite make it in. Um, and hopefully this works reasonably digitally, given as I say it's previously been a face-to-face -face thing. So here we go. Um, leadership in insight, I, I think, has driven as a really key subject now that analytics has finally become cool. It's the whole Halvarian quote about the sexiest job in the 21st century. So suddenly insight and analysis is this key thing. And I think the whole COVID lockdown process has made that even more so as, as companies have really struggled to try to understand what's going on in, at the moment with consumers and customer behaviour. Um, I think analysts don't often always realise just how important and integral analysis now is, particularly those of us who've been around a, a, a few years and kind of were the back office geeks for lots of companies for a long while. Um, I think this change is because analytics really will define who wins and loses in, a, in the 21st century economy. Um, there's the famous Schmidt and Rosenberg quote about uh, we're in the era of big data and big data needs statisticians to make sense of it. And the, the whole data is the sword of the 21st century and those who wield it well, the samurai. One of the good things about digital, I'm no longer tempted to stand up on a stage and try to swish an imaginary sword about where my wife reminds me I look more like Kung Fu Panda than a samurai. Um, <laughs> the, uh, the, the key thing, I think IBM um, called this fairly well. The people who will win in the 21st century with analytics will be the guys who've got the access to the best data. Right? The IBM say most, and I probably put a slight caveat and would say best data the people who have the best ability to garner insight and act on that data and then who can execute at the moment of truth with it so that second point is why it's so key because that to me is about building a great team that can drive the insights from that analysis and getting that team structure right um in terms of how much things have changed what really drove this home to me a few years ago and you can talk to a few years ago because i need to update the tv programs um if i look at my, my daughter and my wife are both massively into american sort of procedural cop shows and virtually every every one of them now has this cool character that sits behind a computer screen generating the insight for the guys who are going out fact, finding the criminals and I, th I think that's um enormously different to when i was an analyst 30 years ago and you just need to look at things like how the image of say Sherlock Holmes has changed from Basil Rathbone to Benedict Cumberbatch how Q has changed and if you've told somebody you were a professor in anything when I when 30 years ago the vision was out of the wacky racism Professor Pat Pending it's uh, it's enormously changed and this geek behind the screen is now a, a cool role but what that hasn't really done yet I think is translated through into how um leadership insight teams are led often but also in terms of the example of leaders in this sort of program the guy behind the the, the screen is still the geek the guy leading it is still some bloke with a gun and usually is a bloke with a gun um and there's a gap between how we set up analysts to succeed as they get to more senior levels in organizations and i think some of that is down to how companies have recruited people and then how they've probably not realized how they need supporting um when certainly when my first role in managing an insight team i got it from the time honored method and the one that still a lot of companies use of promote the best analyst and it will be all right uh they'll kind of figure it out they understand how these other geeks work it'll be okay they know how this stuff works and we really don't um and you can still see that now in a lot of adverts for senior roles which still require people to have a phd and code 17 different languages it's a nice to have but that if you're looking for a senior role 
that's not really the skill set you need from a senior person. And the example I give is that the best players don't Um, come from football and cricket. So the football one is, if you look at the three managers who've won more Premier League titles than anybody else, okay, Ferguson by a distance, but you you look at what they've won and how good of players they actually were. Um, Ferguson, I think, as a player, won one Scottish FA Cup runners-up medal with Aberdeen. Wenger played, I think, 12 games to Strasbourg in the equivalent of the French version of the championship. And Mourinho played amateur football. He was too slow to play uh, professional football. None of them great players. Um, <clears throat> the, the guys on the right, far better players, but the square root of bugger all that they've won as managers on the whole. Um, because actually, sometimes it just doesn't translate. And I realise the cricket example, um, desperately pressing page down and hoping this is still working. So, Martin, I think we've uh, just lost your slides there, at least on my side. Oh, right. I will. Um, I'll try to fire them up again. I'll have to just um, stop the sharing and try to refire them. Ah, yeah. Okay, sorry about that. Yeah, we're back. Yeah. Um, Wonderful. Um, yeah, apologies to those of you not even born in 1981 or who don't like cricket, where I'd imagine that's a Venn diagram with a lot of people in it. Um, in England played Australia in 1981, and at the time they made the guy to lead the team, a guy called Ian Botham, who was there or thereabouts, one of the best cricketers in the world at the time. What could go wrong with Botham leading the team? Um, two games in, we'd lost one test match badly and got saved by rain in another one and we'd get in absolutely hammered and both of them resigned because he hated the job. And England appointed a guy called Mike Brearley, who was at best a pretty average batsman. Um, if I said just about good enough to play for England, that's probably pushing it. Um, England won three, England ended up winning the series 3-1. Um, both of them started playing brilliantly, both, uh, Brearley got the best out of the team. Um, Rodney Hogg, the Australian cricketer, afterwards said that England won because Mike Brearley had a degree in people. Uh, Brearley actually makes a living as a uh, behavioural psychologist and consultant now out of Cambridge. Um, anybody who likes leadership books, um, The Art of Captaincy is a bloody good leadership book, even if you don't like cricket, and definitely a really good read if you do. Um, but I think it really makes the point that leadership and being the best player are not the same, and it's still often not how companies treat who you hire. Um, and one of the reasons that really matters in analytics is um, if you look at the, the sort of Myers-Briggs type thing about people and people types, there's an associated thing in the same sort of ballpark, if you like, called Career Anchors, uh, written by two guys whose names I'm not even going to attempt to pronounce. It's a, a really good process. And it looks at what the key anchors, the key drivers to people's careers are. And it splits them by by the list on the slide, security, independence, creativity. And one of them is managerial. And I think the key assumption that lots of companies make is that when you put somebody in a leadership role, their driver will be managerial. People want to move forward and manage teams and be part of a general management process. And I think the Botham example, and a lot of people have seen an in insight, say, actually, that's not necessarily the case. Often people promote a bloody good analyst and actually then turn them into a crap manager instead of leaving them as a bloody good analyst and paying them properly to be a really good analyst. Some people, principal analyst roles are better for some people than being in management. And this really comes through when I think I've now done the questionnaires and done this as part of the course with about 150 people. And it has changed slightly over the last five or 10 years. One thing hasn't changed. You still do this questionnaire with a bunch of senior analysts or people who are in their first managerial role in analysis. Generally, less than 10% of them have managerial as their key driver. It's just actually they don't want to run the universe. What happened 10 years ago was they were either nearly always technical or competence-based. I want to be the best analyst I can. Or potentially autonomy or independence. I want to be left on my own to get on with the work. Um, what's changed a little bit the last couple of years, lifestyle has come through dramatically. And I think there is a real change, whether that's um, age of candidate driven 
but lifestyle is enormously more important. But fundamentally, most of the people who you would promote from senior analyst are not necessarily wanting to be the chief exec. And definitely their team doesn't want to be chief exec, which again, I think is really interesting. And another of the, these type of, of the, this I keep calling the colours model because I can't remember its proper name. But um, again, it's one of these Myers-Briggs type things as to what drives people. And this one um, splits people into reds, which are the, uh, the the sort of just get on with it, charge forward men of action sort of, or women of action sort of thing. Yellow is creative types, blue is detail, green is people people, so to speak. When you look at this, and this has been done with a lot of boards in organisations and senior management teams, it's dominated by reds. And the, the cliches are you could almost go around the boardroom and say the marketing director's red, yellow, the CFO's red, blue, the HR director's red, green, but there's lots of reds. Insight teams, when they do this, an analysis team are blue, green, dominated enormously. They're people who do numbers and they've got a real sense of fairness and teamwork. So you've got a real split between actually some of the traditional leadership behaviours and still how leadership is taught and actually how insight teams operate. And they, this gets me to, I think, how you bridge that dichotomy is really the crux of insight leadership. So I think insight leadership and analysis leadership is less about the technical skills and different to some other leadership roles. But really, I think the crux of it is you need to know enough about analysis and enough about the supply process. You need to be able to know enough about the technology. You certainly need to know how to get the best out of an insight and analysis team. And you need to know how to actually run the best supply engine you can for analytics. But you need to be able to manage demand for analysis in the organization, both stopping yourself getting swamped with daft requests, but also how do you really tie into the strategy and make sure that insight and analysis is integral to your organization. <clears throat> I know that is far more important than knowing what the, the latest sort of Python library will do. Um, so if you're gonna make this right and make this operate, um, I, th I think there isn't a standard guidebook for it. There's not most of the HR training courses that I've been sent on over the years still kind of assume you've got a managerial driver. They, they assume that somebody leading an analysis team will broadly need the same skill sets as somebody who leads say a sales team um or a store team, team and it often i don't think that's true um so there's a few books which i've i've, I've put this slide up um because basically a lot of the next slides pull for ideas from these so if you want to know where i've nicked things from that this is the kind of reading list um but leadership skills in this model, I think for lots of analysts, you can take as given that somebody moving forward in their career has got the base technical competence, personal productivity, multitasking, the core, all good analysts should have. If somebody's got to senior analyst and they're looking to develop forward, you probably also can describe business context of analytics. You can make the compromises between business and analytics constraints and you can manage stakeholder relationships. But the Rubicon I think you need to cross is how do you manage that technical team? How do you expand client relationships? So not just do a good job of delivering the one project, but become actually proper stakeholder advisors to people. A big one for me, how do you work through others to make uh, make others more productive? Um, the biggest mistake I made early on as a leading a small team was if anything came in that was really important or scary, I'd do it myself. Um, because I got the job by being the best analyst. Um, you do that, you chase the rest of your team off really quickly. Um, you pile up work because you're trying to be the senior analyst and the insight manager, and you nearly give yourself a nervous bloody breakdown. It, it's a, it, you, you have to realise that you, your job is, particularly as you get bigger teams, you can try putting in 10% extra effort yourself gets you so far, but if you're leading a team of 20 people, you can put in 50% extra yourself, but you'd be better off getting 10% extra out of the 20 people who work for you in terms of productivity of your organization. Um, so, and I think the other thing here is about playing positive politics. And what, what I mean by that is lots of people again promoted the first time into analytical management roles, hate the idea of actually getting involved in politics. They, they see this as an enormous evil <clears throat> and something that 
they want to avoid and, and almost shy away from the uh, getting involved in some of the leadership processes in organisations. And I think that's because if you look on a scale of politics from um, people having low integrity to high integrity or low awareness of political goings on, so to speak, to high awareness, um, nobody's probably the inept donkey in the bottom of low integrity and low awareness. Something's just gone wrong there. But lots of analysts end up the innocent lamb. Um, they've got high integrity, but they don't want to get their hands dirty because they see themselves as as they'll turn somehow into this fox of this cunning low integrity thing. Um, and foxes get a bad rep because they, they get, uh, I think this is their reputation for if they get into a hen house, they'll kill all the hens rather than just the one they need to eat. I did this once with a farmer in the group who, um, uh, the uh, person who'd been brought up on a farm who told me that was unfair to foxes. Seemingly, they're just bright. They kill the rest of the hens as collateral damage so that they don't get shot. Um, they don't want the farmer waking up. So it's not quite as bloodthirsty as uh, they're tagged with. But uh, the comparison is owls where they just kill what they need. They do kill. Uh, but the idea all organisations have owls who are prepared to make tough decisions, but are connected to the process and owls need more owls, frankly. So there's a degree of getting involved in this sort of thing is not necessarily evil. You can be a force for good. And I think convincing people of that um, in terms of a willingness to step up and take on leadership roles is important. Um, I've talked a bit in general, so I thought the next sort of few slides are all about a specific leadership model and I think why leadership models in knowledge worker teams whether that's IT or analytics vary from traditional leadership models so this um, this is taken from the leading geeks book which is a very good book with a very bad title um, but the traditional leadership model <clears throat> in lots of organizations then this is changing a little bit but still for many places leadership is about establishing and maintaining a power base the leaders are the people who make decisions. They direct activities. They are the external representation for their teams and they motivate their followers, which literally has been lots of books about leadership have used those words. Um, I've certainly never found that directing activities, I can get any analyst to do something just because I've told them to. Um, it, to be honest, they're, uh, they're, they're too intelligent. They're too prone to asking bloody good questions and it's too easy for them to go get another job. Um, you've kind of got to approach them in a different way. I think that comes through in the what's more the knowledge worker model, which still has furnished external representation. You're still the salesperson for your team. But the other skills become around providing internal facilitation. So connecting your team with what's going on, managing ambiguity about what is it we're here to do and nurturing motivation so it's not about getting followers to do what you want but about how do you create the right environment to create a great team and i've just picked a few examples i'll talk about around each of these so the nurturing motivation is the one i start with which i've always just filed under the the phrase analysts don't whoop um otherwise known as how to fill a seemingly bottomless pit of apathy at standard techniques to motivate people really i've never found worked very well um and i'll, I'll give a couple of examples of this it's, it's almost the sort of the employee of the week and when people have said oh we'll give a bottle of wine away at some monthly team event um i worked in a global brands team that had a big quarterly event and had a kind of quarterly stars thing and the leadership team, we had to stand at the front of the stage, two minutes each for each member of our team who'd won something to get up to the stage, go on stage, say a few nice words, explain the project, pass a bottle of fairly cheap plonk away and them to get back. And I had to say to the guy running it, I'm going to need five minutes, not two. And he kind of goes, oh, God, he's not going to make an Oscar speech, is he? And I went, no, that's not the problem. So the problem was the guy I was giving this to was a very good analyst, but he'd be sat in the back row. He'd look up from the back row and pretend he wasn't there or try to imagine, uh, pretend people hadn't seen him. He'd then do the 100 yards to the front at a speed of a wounded Ewok, stare at me from the bottom of the stage for a couple of minutes saying, boss, please don't make me. Finally get up and then the wounded Ewok would get to the bottom of the stage and the 100 metres back to his chair, he'd have beaten Linford bloody Christie. But this was never going to be five minutes because he hated the idea. Um... In another organisation, we had a cash award, uh, which was actually worth having. It wasn't tiny. And one of my team won it won, uh, one quarter and she refused to take it at first because she said it wasn't her best work. 
any member of the team could have been given it and it was fairly random and she didn't think it was actually worth the award um, above what other members of the team had done. I had a real rigmarole to kind of persuade her of who else is going to get given it, what they're going to do with it. The fact that I know it wasn't a difficult piece of work, but I was happy she'd won it because she'd done four or five other brilliant pieces of work. It's just the one I could justify for it was simpler because the marketing director loved it. In the end, the only way I got her to accept it was because I persuaded her that she could give the money to her favourite charity if she won it. So I actually got her over the line from what otherwise would have been a, a bit of a PR disaster. Um, I think what's worked better is intrinsic versus that sort of extrinsic motivation. Um, I've got more value by people who've asked for a second screen for their uh, for their desk station and gone I've, I've signed a load of those off over the years with a business case that pretty much says because it'll make my analysts happy and happy analysts would work better and the screen cost 80 quid behave and uh, give them a screen um g give people things that matter to them and matter to their role rather than kind of random bottles of five quid per main seems to work an awful lot better along with communicating why projects matter I analysts particularly hate the bit where you drop something on them and then no one bothers to tell you why they're doing it. Um, but the other thing in here on motivation is I, I've always also found that big you get big gains for just dust-busting demotivators. Every time people do these great place-to-work type surveys, you always get these massive ideas for how you can improve things and improve how your team work and in, basically improve morale, for lack of a better way of looking at it. They're usually difficult. None of them ever really come to pass and they take ages. Um, it's being aware of the small things and being willing to fight for them. Um, when I was at Boots, and this, this story is well known, so it, it's kind of, I, I don't feel guilt at saying where it was. Boots come up with a bright idea once that they'd do away with proper milk in fridges and go to powdered milk for the, uh, instead of free milk for the tea breaks. There was rebellion. There was mourning. They, uh, it, it just went down like a lead balloon. Me and two of the other heads of the department went to the procurement team and said, I'm not sure how much money you think you're saving, but I'm going to have 25 analysts um, running a spreadsheet with rotors for who's buying the milk because they're going to buy their own. They're going to be marking bottles. There's going to be a, you'll waste more time in analytical productivity by analysts not actually working than you will in the powdered bloody milk. Um, my boss thought I'd gone mental because I'd gone and spent a couple of hours arguing to get the powdered, get proper milk back. It would have saved me, back to the point of 20 people doing more work, it would have saved me 100 hours of analytical effort if I hadn't have done that. Um, so I, th I think just get rid of the things that annoy your team often work better. Um, and the other thing I massively believe in is get the team involved in projects early. I hate work request databases and will tend to ignore them if I at all can. I far prefer to get, I think, agile even if you're not doing Agile properly, but to get analysts into Agile teams and into working squads, rather than being a person the Agile team or squad will ask for some information, just makes an enormous difference in terms of how your, your team operates. Um, and also not sort of sitting over their shoulder. Um, again, I'm a great believer in, in focus on <clears throat> goals that you want and not how people do stuff. I, I think you can tell somebody what to do or how to do something. You can't tell them both. Um, and then just make sure the team's developing their skills. Now, I'll come back to this one later because I've got another slide with that one on. Um, so I'm just, uh, yeah, just come somewhere I'm on time. Um, the second one of the four was managing ambiguity. And I think ambiguity comes in three types, environmental, structural and task. Um, environmental, you're the person who sets the, the story for the team. Um, who are the team? How do they relate to the outside? What's their purpose? Why, why are they doing work? Um, even as a new team manager, you can sometimes think you don't know everything and actually don't know all the answers. You're still your team's best source of information. So telling them what you do know is better than them not knowing anything because you're not sure you know everything. Um, but you're the area, you're the person that needs to define how the team's narrative fits to the big stuff the organisation does. Because um, the closer the team feel to that, the better. So I think that's the environmental stuff. There's also structural ambiguity. What work gets done and how it gets done and how you select projects. And you need some sort of process here. Um, one I've used before has been just literally to say the most important stuff is, can, is does this link to the strategy goals of the organisation? 
priority two, does this link to the marketing or trading plans? Is there a number where somebody will say, if I don't get this piece of work, then there is X pounds in the marketing budget that I won't now allocate and C is everything else. But back to the tell the analyst what's going on for real. I've always had a process where I've agreed my teams that <clears throat> I kind of want to have a couple of wild cards to that because I don't want somebody, every organisation has a couple of people that are just very, very senior and you don't ever want your analysts asking them to justify quite where the financial return on the analytics is. Um, you just want them to get on and do it and worry about it later as long as it's not an enormous four-week project. If it's two days' work, just get it done. You can only do it with a couple of stakeholders, but again, I think it really it solves an awful lot of problems if you're just up front with that sort of stuff and go, yeah, the normal process does not apply to those two people there. I'll worry about sorting that out later. Leave that to me. I, I think that that works a lot better. Um, I've mentioned projects a couple of times, and I think the, <clears throat> the other thing for me is... Um, I'm a big believer on the, I mentioned people development earlier, and I think as a, a leader, the biggest thing that you've got that should be your main responsibility is um, uh, the best piece of career advice I was ever given was about 30 years ago. I went to my boss at the time, asked him for a pay rise and got categorically told no, and I sulked and told him, why should I not leave then? Um, why should I work for him? And he said, I can't guarantee you a pay rise. I can't even guarantee you a bonus. If you ever get promoted to the right level, sort of level, you'll realise you've got less control of the purse strings than you actually think. I'd, I'd learnt that the hard way over the years as well. He did say the one thing he would do, though, is he would guarantee that every year I worked for him, I'd have a better CV at the end of that year than the start. And he advised me to rewrite my CV every December, or once a year anyway. I still rewrite my CV over Christmas every year religiously on on this on that basis that it measures whether I'm learning and moving forward. And I think delivering that goal of 100% braggable work, things that will improve a CV or at least as close as you can is enormously important. And doing that is about working with with teams to make sure that everything's a project as much as you can. Um one example again from somewhere I've worked, I had one guy work for me who his job was to look after market share data. And anybody who's ever looked at this, um, to paraphrase George Box a bit, all market share reads are useful. All of them are wrong. Um, and it faults in the data, faults in how organisations mess about. So Boots put um, put dental in healthcare. No one else in the UK does that. So you've immediately, your dental read and healthcare read are wrong. Um or wrong every time you talk to a supplier. So it, this was a nightmare. The guy spent a load of his time just trying to fix problems in data. And I talked to him and said that, why don't we turn that into a project to say, how do we produce the guide to how the market share sources should be used and interpreted for the organisation? Give them a star rating, say what they're good at, what they're not good at, and take that to the commercial leadership team once a quarter. And he did that. And suddenly that was a valuable project well regarded by people and he became the expert on all things on those data sources but that was turning something into a project with a scale deliverable rather than just being the bloke who sorts out that healthcare looks two percent wrong this month um the third one of these i've put down is provide internal facilitation um the guy in the bottom right for anybody who's my age you will know is headley or henley rather from the great escape when you used to only have two TV channels, that film was on on Boxing Day every Christmas. Um, he was the guy who didn't actually escape, but he was the guy who f we figured out where you get all the shovels, how you hide the earth, etc. Um, the higher you go in any organisational structure, the more dependent you are on your team for success or failure. It's far more about how you get the best out of the, the team. You can't actually just succeed on your own shoulders anymore. An environment matters enormously to that. Um, it's about enabling your people to do great work. Um, the the book there is Creativity Inc. by Catmull, who was Ed Catmull, who ran Pixar, which is a great book on how do you do exactly that in a creative organisation. And the quote I took from that is is again a massive part of the role is how do you help smart, ambitious people work effectively with one another, create a fertile environment, keep it healthy, and watch for things that undermine it. And again, in terms of leadership, that's disproportionate <clears throat> because, again, this is about getting that extra five or 10 percent out of the, the people who work for you in the team.
Um, I think in terms of external representation, um, do you have a brand? Um, by a brand, I don't mean a logo, although if you want one, they're not a bad idea. But do you have a manifesto for what you want to change in the organisation? Are you aligning insight and analysis with the needs of the organisation? And are you making sure that your organisation understands what analysis and insight can add? And building that joint vision and championing what the team do. Um, a kind of fifth one that should be a circle is around talent and discovery, development and retention. And again, I don't think you can put too much um, emphasis on this one. Um, I'm a cynic when it comes to mission statements. That WPP had one I do like, which was to develop and manage talent, to apply that talent throughout the world for the benefit of clients in partnership for profit. Again, it's this point about developing and bringing in the right people. In terms of talent, I think that's the New York Yankees, the uh, the Bolshoi Ballet, the Cirque du Soleil. And I'm a Wolves fan, so that's Wolves playing Honved in 1954, which was probably the last time we were actually really good. Um, and you can take quotes as well from the likes of Tom Peters on this. And I'd, I'd love this quote from him, which is, your principal moral obligation as a leader is to develop the skill set, soft and hard, of every one of the people in your charge. And I like the way he puts temporary as well as semi-permanent in there to the maximum extent of your abilities. Um, and as I say, in his belief, it's also the one that maximizes profit for organizations. Um, and again, to Richard Branson, very similar thoughts, train people well enough so they can leave, treat them well enough so they don't want to. Uh, I think there's an enormous amount in that. Um, <clears throat> and I'm trying to summarize where this <coughs> gets to. I, I think the role of a, a leader in an insight and analysis team is a long way away from being the in both and best analyst. And it's really around um, how do you become almost the CEO for your team? And I think one really great way of thinking about things is what would you do differently if your organisation tomorrow effectively made you and your entire area redundant and then re-employed you as a contractor, as an independent um, team? And said, there you go, that's how much we're paying you. It's all yours. Do as you want with that. Provide us the service on an SLA. Because then suddenly you're in charge of strategy, marketing, PR and sales for your team. Operations, which is oddly the bit about manufacturing and delivery of insight. It's the bit where most people spend most of their time and think the entire job is. But quality management, finance, HR, R&D, you become responsible about how do you build this effectively an internal consultancy. Um, the last sort of five or ten minutes of the bit I was going to talk through before the Q&A. Um, I'm not sure I've altered all the slides here because I've got it down to six and not ten. Um, bear with me. But I think that the, the knowledge model is theoretical. I thought I'd just kind of finish with, I, I mentioned that the first time I got put in a role leading an insight team, I was the classical best analyst in the team, chuck him in there, it'll be all right. And the amount of screw ups I managed to make in 18 months, I'm surprised I never got fired. And I learned an awful lot, though. Um, but I did learn it the hard way. So th these are the things I really wish somebody had taught, sat me down and told me before they kind of packed me off on a, a few sort of HR courses. Um, or as um, <clears throat> an old Spanish proverb would say, talking about bulls is not the same thing about being in a bull ring. Um, the, the first couple are... Um, show me the money have a plan and i think a plan doesn't have to be rocket science but you need to link your team back to the big strategy stuff it's it's great if you can link the plan for your team to financial returns and how much value did we add in x y or z <coughs> what's the extra response rates <coughs> for me um how much monetary value did we add but that's usually difficult it's usually time consuming and you'll always get other teams arguing about what their share in anything was. So it becomes tricky. In any plan I've made, I've always been very keen to look at what's the four or five big bullet points on your organisational strategy and how can you line up everything you do so that it's a supporting pillar to those key objectives? Because somebody else has already made the business case for them. So if you can say that taking away something you do harms that strategy delivery, that's a lot easier to do, and it helps the team understand how they fit with the strategy. So definitely having an insight or analytics plan. And the slide I've got, the, part, the bit at the bottom is just a random one from one year at Boots. 
Boots' mission was to champion everyone's right to feel good. It was about making their customers look and feel better than they ever thought possible. To do that, there was a line in the strategy that said, to do that, we do, we need to get customers and markets better than anyone else, which was a godsend for me because that was the, basically the strap line for my insight plan because the insight plan was, how do we do that? And it tied back into something which all the directors knew was on their strategy plan, and it meant you could start talking the right language with them straight away. Um, the third one's the training budget. I, I've mentioned training. Um, my, my core belief, if you ever have any say in the matter, never let HR hold your training budget. I've usually managed to justify a technical training budget, and it's the one I've kind of been the zealot for. I'll give up most other budgets. I'll trim most other budgets before this. This is the one that anybody who knows they want my training budget is going to have to fight. Um, and people don't want to fight zealots. You, um, it comes back to this point, and I know it's the third time I've said it, but I've, that's deliberate, and it's because it's really important. Um if you deliver the team a better CV at the end of the year than the start, it means they've done great work and it means they're better able to do great work the year after. Um, the bit at the bottom just has improve on it around improvement, just because I think it's quite funny that improve is next to impropriety in the data, but in the dictionary, but that's my sense of humour, sorry. Um, number four, again, I think is really important to people in their first roles looking after teams. And it's really difficult in small teams, but uh, I don't actually really mean burn the sequel manual. Um, I, I, anybody who burns books is never on the right side of an argument. Um, but you need to be telling your boss that you know you've been hired now to lead a team and not be the best analyst. So um, actually putting away the sequel book, well, one of the best guys I had worked for me, I, I made him a team leader from senior analyst. And he actually came to me after I'd, I'd done this internally. And he gave me a pile of books and told me to look after them in a cupboard because he said he wasn't burning them. But he made the point of he didn't want to be tempted. So he asked me to look after his uh, manuals, which was a stunningly brilliant way of playing me into the kind of you've told me I need to do this now. Uh, make sure I can. And it's, it's 200 years ago, the economist David Ricardo said this is about comparative advantage. You want somebody to do a great job of leading the team. Don't try to have them do a great job of two things at once. Um. The other thing I think you've got to do uh, that I, took me a long while to move away was prioritisation. Virtually every analytics team I've ever worked in, analysts are nice people. They say yes to far too many people, um, either because they're nice or because somebody's given them something really interesting to do that looks cool um, or because somebody important's asked them. I, I like this one, which is just taken straight out of um, a customer services example. Uh, which is pick two from good, cheap and fast. Um, good analytics, cheap, won't be quick. Good analytics, fast, uh, won't be, uh, sorry, good analysis, cheap, won't be fast. Good analysis, fast, won't be cheap. And fast analysis, cheap, won't be any good. And I, I think this works really well in one form or other in most organisations. And you kind of need to be the front for saying that. And sometimes you do just need to protect your team from strange requests. So being the um, I'd love to do this for you, but go ask Martin. And then it's down to whether people, you know, the people will hunt me down, the ones who really do need something quick. Um, it also helps present people with choices. Um, if you can have, if there's four great projects you can do and you can only do three, make them pick the three. Uh, and six is people, uh, which is, is the, the last one I've got on here. Um, the biggest thing I... The, the biggest mistake I made hiring when I was a, a leader of a team the first couple of times out, it took me quite a long time and a lot of effort to get to lead a team for the first time. I got a pay rise for it. It wasn't an enormous pay rise. Um, and then you come to try to recruit your replacement and think, I'm going to hire some guy who's on about £4.50 in a bag of marbles, less than what I'm getting paid for leading the team. <laughs> and you get quite, so I got quite sulky. And then I realised I was being an idiot. Um, never, ever compromise on recruitment. Uh, you're better having a vacancy in your team than putting someone in who'll only ever be a bum in a seat. Um, partly because if you put somebody in who's average and will never be better than average, that just gives you a, a problem that's going to last forever. Um, oddly, hiring really bad people is less of a problem because there's stuff you can do about that. Um, but if you hire the people who are really good to the maximum of the budget you've got available, even if you're kind of occasionally looking, thinking, 
I'm not getting paid that much more for a load more hassle. These are the people who learn your pay rises and large bonuses going forward. Hire the best people you can. Or again, back to Ed Catmull, who's, who's frankly knows far more about this than me, but always try to hire people who are smarter than you. Always take a chance on better, even if it seems like a potential threat. Uh, but absolutely fill the team with the best talent you possibly can. Um, so the, the wrap-up for me is actually that step from senior analyst to leading an insight team. Analyst to senior analyst is the same job, but bigger fundamentally in, in my head, for, in a lot of places still, a bit of a simplification. But moving to leading a team is totally different, but that's not a bad thing. You get it right, you get to make analyst jobs easier, and a third of our lives are spent at work. So you get to try and make people's lives better, which is cool. And you get to talk people and influence the stuff that really matters in your organisation. So, um, yeah, it, it's fun, but it is different. Um, and that's all the slides I've got. So I'm going to stop sharing the screen. And I think uh, we'd, um, we've I've left, I think I've managed to leave 15 minutes for Q&A. Thanks, Martin. That was really good. Um, we've had a few questions already. So, I can't do them. so uh, the first one is from Hamad Sumro. Um, he asks... What have you found are the worst traits of leadership and how how do these affect authority in team behaviour? Oh, um, um, I'm desperately rooting around for something because I think I uh, I think I wrote something down on that. In a, I've got something written down, but I'm not sure if it's in a pad that's anywhere near me. So I won't be more than about five seconds looking, but no, can't find it. But um, I, I think... Broadly, people who don't listen to people. Um, so yeah, but poor listening skills, I, th I think, is is the one which has caused more causes more problems than than anything else. Um, and in terms of again, not being bothered about things that a lot of people manage to be um, good at listening to things that are work related, but not were not very good at listening if somebody just wants to sit down and actually vent or talk to them for 15 minutes about something that's driving them mental. And and to me it's that you've you kind of you can't pretend to care. You've got to put the time in with it. Um so yeah it, it's listening to people and I think so listening to the team is one thing but also understanding that when you communicate most people don't get that excited by analytics to communicate about the business value. Um, not necessarily the, nobody cares how you did something. They care about the results and what they can do with them. Thanks. Um, so next question is from David Hawksworth. Um, he mentioned that he loved the percentage work workload statement. Um, he mentioned that he had an insight manager who will benefit from it as well. So he asks, have you found uh, an easier way to affect this behavioural change in people? Um, I, <clears throat> so <clears throat> for, for me, the moment I realised that I was doing it was I was uh, early, early on leading teams. We got a new piece of software in and I was about to go. Um, I booked myself on the course on the grounds that I should know how the software works. So I could know how, what value my team got. And one of my team fronted me up and went, uh, you're not meant to do that anymore. And really, we know you're a better analyst than us, but all you're going to do is prove the point again. And frankly, I don't need that. We need you to make us better. So I, I actually got called out on it by somebody who was quite brave in my team, which really helped me. Um, as a leader, I it was, again, it was just really helpful. I think in terms of managing upwards with it, because often people put a really good analyst in charge and then forget that they've let them run the team, I think you've just got to drip feed and remind people that actually what your workload is and how much of that is leading the team and how little it can be hands on. And I've always been very, very um, keen to make sure that who's doing the analysis work gets put in front of people. And I've usually spent time having a coffee with the senior people going, look, I would have done this myself. I'm not doing it myself because I'm now having to lead the team and develop them. I am keeping an eye on this, but x or y or z is going to come and present that i'd love to get your feedback afterwards be nice with them it will probably take them a little bit longer they're probably i'm developing their skills but i really fronted into that conversation to kind of say i'll get them to here but i need a bit of time to get them to there but i'm getting five people skilled up we will be better as a result 
Uh, but just hammer that conversation home with people. And I think most people do listen. You get a bit of grumpiness, but in general, people listen. Great, thanks. Um, next question from Jonathan Romero. Um, he asks, um, I'll get a few questions here. Um, he asks how to deal with red tape managers who don't listen and are threatened by your analysis. Uh, maybe who rely on opinion and instinct rather than data and block you out of conversations. So how, how to deal with them, basically. Um, <clears throat> okay, this... Um, most organisations I've worked in, it, it's very difficult if that's the one person you do work for. That becomes really tricky. Um, if it's a question of you're working for, say, five category teams or, or a number of different stakeholders, um, I've been a great believer in finding the ones who you can work well with, champion them, and uh, getting people promoted is a really good way of getting other people to listen. So um, within one of the people, one of the organisations I worked for, we did... It's always difficult to sell things into the bigger trading teams. They've done things the same way for years and getting them to change can be tricky. The guys who've had no insight, no analytics and are at the in the more, um, shall we say, kind of less sexy categories, they'll nearly always listen. Get a couple of them promoted. The guys in the other categories start listening. So if you've got multiple stakeholders, it's find a champion, find somebody who will be your best friend and make them look a bloody hero. That, that I think, always works well. Um, if it really is one person and you're plugging away with one person and banging the head against a brick wall, um, I guess I'm slightly in the life's too short. There's a lot of interesting rules about there. I'm probably pointing people Chris's way on that one. It's, uh, I, I, I think, um, organizations where you're just banging your head against a brick wall, um, stop it in your head against the wall and go find somewhere that uh, values your talent would be my, uh, advice on that one. Sorry, I'm not politically correct in lots of uh, answers to things, but uh, there's a lot of demand for analysts out there. You don't have to put up with bullshit. Yeah, thanks for the plug as well, Martin. <laughs> um, and next, we have Paul Randalls. Uh, he, he asks if you can give an example of when you've uh, had to deny a senior management project request and how you dealt with it. Um, my, 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 my usual method involves an awful lot of coffee, but... Um, I think the, the key bit for me is if the first time you've ever spoken to somebody at a senior level is to deny them the project, you're in a world of pain. Um, I, I think if this is a person you've spoken to and you've built a relationship with over a number of months and then you've got to go and have a conversation, you're in a lot better place. So to me, it's about having the conversations and developing the relationships with your key stakeholders even when you don't have necessarily a project to go talk to them about. Because once you can actually build that connection, you can have a human conversation with people about why do they need to do the work. Um, the other thing is having a really clear view of um, what your team is doing before you go in. So where you are in a, where you always get in a world of pain is if you don't know what, because a, a trader will just ask you, well, what needs to be true to make something happen? Um, so you almost need to be able to say, look, if I could do this, but I then I can't do this or this. It particularly works well if that person has got three projects with you already, because you can say, which one of these other two do you want to put on ice? Um, there's a, an old IT um, application that was called RAD, uh, which was Rapid Application Development, which is about creating a box that said any resource that you had was about time on one axis, money on another and people. And it kind of said, this box is the most I can do in that time with that money and with that people. And if you wanted to actually put anything else in the box, you had to either take something out of the box or give you more time, more money or more people. Again, for the more uh, technical stakeholders, I've used that with, with quite a bit of success because it comes with, because then you can always say, yes, I can do anything you want. But you either need to tell me, need to tell me what else I can stop or give me more time or more money or more FTE. And it then makes them engage with kind of how they want to move the box. Great, thanks. Um, next question, we have uh, Matthew Jackson. Um, you mentioned that if, if a senior team member's personal motivation is to lead a team, how do you nurture their development? Uh, is there any experience um, in that situation where a team member perhaps has different ideas to you and how to run things? Um, so, yeah, um, 
So I, I think giving them projects to run is a really good way of doing it. Um, where we've had pe I've had people who want to develop their their skill sets. Um, I've run apprenticeship schemes within data science, and I've also utilised MSc students on sponsored projects before. And I, they're a great way of giving people some exposure who want to lead teams but don't necessarily have a an opportunity because what you can do is you can effectively make them the mentor for either apprentices or for people who are doing an MSc. So it gives them a taste of leading people and a, a taste of how to do it, lets you see whether they're they're good at it and, and give, gives them some of that exposure. So I think that works. Um, it, yeah, if you've got people who've got that mindset, it's great. Also, I think what I would find is speak to the learning and de development team in your organisation because they're the people who um, L&D will have a better right. If you want to run teams and want to run things, most of the HR development stuff is actually probably tailored quite well for you. It, it's tailored less well if you don't want to do that necessarily in a kind of in a weird position. Um, but yeah, talk to the L&D teams, but I, I would give them projects to do or let them mentor people. Cheers, Martin. Um, bit of a bit of an open one here. So Mel Rawlinson just asks, what are your top tips for improving skills across your team generally? Um, so I, I think it's about how you allocate time. So I, I, I've stolen this blatantly from um, some of the consultancies, the likes of Experian, the CACIs, etc. How they think about things is in billable hours. So for most of the consultancies, if you work in an organisation, it's easy to think 100% of your time is doing stuff and producing things. Um, most of the consultancies will have a billable hours estimate at about 70, 75%. They'll then estimate about 15% is an assorted, 10, 15 will be in assorted admin team meetings, et cetera, and about 10, 15% is development. I would specifically adopt something like that that says actually 10, 15% of some of everybody in the team's time should be dedicated to development. Once you do that, you can then discuss with them whether that's training courses, whether it's projects that are on things they've not done before and need new skills. But basically, it becomes about how they spend that 10 to 15%. And I think forcing that through and, and repeating that as a mantra works really well. Great. And I think just, just last question now. So from Rugby Dave, um, he mentioned how to influence, he asks how to influence stakeholders to influence them to move from Excel spreadsheets to bigger and better tools necessary for the business, like moving from Excel to Azure Cloud. Uh, he asked how, how we can, how can we influence the business to take it positively? Um, <clears throat> so probably two things spring to mind. Um, Depends on which stakeholders. Um, for the more, I would say, the IT and finance end of stakeholders, I think some combination of risk type um, approach works well. So spreadsheets are notoriously fickle. They're very easy to fall over. They're often not well backed up. There's one guy who knows how the spreadsheet works is a single point of failure. And if it screws up, your entire finance forecast can fail at a moment's notice and be irretrievable. So you can scare the hell out of the people who are of, of that mindset. Of the more, <clears throat> I would say, marketing director end, um, I think you've got to look at what's their priorities. Um, I wouldn't start from the technically what it will do at all. I would start from the what are the five things they're trying to deliver this year and then literally work through anything that you want to do next year. How is that going to help them deliver the five things? So if you can tell them why something helps them deliver their priorities, then they'll care. Um, if you try to explain why Azure is better than Excel or something, you, you they'll glaze over. Thanks. Um, I think that's I think that's everything. Uh, I know you're a bit push of time, so should we leave it there? Yeah, I'd, I'd, I've got, yeah, I've definitely got to be off at half past. So um, yeah, I was running down to the last couple of minutes there. Um, I hope, hope that was okay. So it was a very uh, kind of match of the day edit of a normally longer thing. So uh, I, I hope that came across all right. Yeah, well, definitely for my side. So thanks, thanks a lot, Martin. I really appreciate it. Um, no problem at all. Just before I let, uh, see, this is where uh, we struggle trying to. I try to get slides up on my side. Uh, not sure if it's actually worked. Here we go. So just um, yeah. So just before we, we we sign off, I just wanted to give you a bit of insight into our next 
um, webinar session. So it'll be on Friday, the 19th of June at 12.30. We're joined by uh, Sharon Matthew. Um, oh, here we go. It's just starting to load on my computer now. Apologies, being a bit slow, but that's a So um, next Friday, next Thursday, sorry, we're joined by Abed Ashram. He's going to give us uh, insight into how to embed data science within an organisation. Then following that, we're joined by Sharon Matthew, uh, founder of AI Tech North. Uh, that's the following Friday. He's going to give us information regarding uh, advanced analytics strategy for business. Uh, so look out for that. Um, and this is my details again. So as mentioned, uh, if you are in a position where you're looking for a new role or elsewhere, if you're looking to, to hire into your team, feel free to get in touch. Or alternatively, if there's any subjects you would be interested in hearing about uh, during these webinar sessions, obviously I'm more than happy to hear any um, any thoughts on the screen. And thanks everyone for joining. Thanks very much.